This is Monocle 24. You're listening to Monocle 24. This is Monocle 24. You're back with a briefing here on Monocle 24 with me, Steve Bloomfield. A global population expanding at an unsustainable rate. Global food prices spiking and climate change threatening future crop yields. And over one billion people reported to be chronically hungry. These issues and what we can do about them are the subject of the new book, One Billion Hungry, Can We Feed the World? by Sir Gordon Conway, Professor of International Development at the Centre for Environmental Policy at Imperial College London, who joins me in the studio now. Gordon Conway, welcome to Midori House. Uh, Good afternoon. It's good to be here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, So the question you ask in your book is, can we feed the world? Let me ask you that question. Can we? Yes, I think we can, although it's partly because I'm an optimist. <laughs> Good. Uh, at the, the last chapter in the book has got 24 qualifications to that, yes. Um, but you can group them. And in fact, I think there are four routes forward. One is you've got to innovate in an appropriate manner. Second, you've got to create markets which are fair and efficient. Thirdly, you've got to involve people in driving and accepting the change. And in particular, you have to involve women who are key to farming in Africa and elsewhere. And then finally, you need political leadership. You need leaders in both the West and in countries of Africa and India and elsewhere who really focus on food security. You mean, you mentioned leadership there. I mean, I've seen numerous examples where, you know, people have had uh, food that they want to take to market, but they can't because because the roads don't uh, aren't there, they don't exist. It's things like that which often... So there's actually the food is being grown, but it can't get to the people that need it. You're absolutely right about that. And the, the real impact of good leadership is that you've got the environment that creates markets. We've seen that happen, for example, in Ghana. Ghana's been very successful, and the former president, John Kufour, made that all happen. You need markets that provide the seed and the fertilizer and the credit at one end and you need markets at the other end that will buy the crops that the farmers produce we know that farmers in africa can produce three four five tons of maize per hectare but they'll only do it if they know they can sell the extra maize so building the roads and the soft infrastructure too like mobile phones is crucial um you talk about um, you know, with things that can happen in Africa, does that also require us in the West to be a bit more flexible about what it is we believe? I mean, to give an example, in Malawi, uh, you had a president there who uh, thought, well, part of the problem we have here is that uh, people don't have enough fertilizer and they don't have the right, right. seeds. So right. I will give them all fertilizer and right. seeds. Right. And Britain and the US said, well, no, that's interfering with the market. That's that's protectionism or, you know, this is, we, we, you can't do that. Well, it, it wasn't actually quite like that because I was involved in it. Sure. It, it was true that to begin with, the Western countries said that's interfering with the market. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, in the end, it was agreed that there would be a subsidy for the fertilizer and the seeds. And th- that had to be tied with the private sector providing the seed and the fertilizer. And what the British government did was actually to guarantee that this would all work. They didn't provide the subsidy, the the Malawi government did. And they went from 2 million tonnes to 3 million tonnes in one year. So it worked. The problem is that that's not sustainable. No, not sustainable. But it did, even just doing that that small bit, did require the West to sort of change their, sort of be a bit flexible with their political beliefs. That's right. Well, I mean, we we subsidise agriculture in Europe. There's no particular reason why we shouldn't subsidise it elsewhere or that African governments shouldn't subsidise agriculture up to a point. Um, talking more about those sort of different clashes that you get right. between the West and, uh, and and poorer countries, you know, there's a big push for biofuels. Right. Um, and it's seen as it's very good because it means we we'll right. use less fossil right. fuels, but then there's less space for, for food to be grown. That's exactly right. There's- 